last class we were discussing about coagulation and flocculation. We have seen that what is the need of coagulation when we consider the removal of particles. In water, if you consider the solids, the size of the particles vary about 6 order of magnitudes. So, if you want to go for mere settling, it is very, very difficult to remove all the particles present in the water, raw water, water we are using for drinking purpose. So, if you want to increase the rate of particle removal, what we have to do? We have to make these small particles to come together and agglomerate and form bigger particles. That is the purpose of coagulation and flocculation. So, what we are doing in coagulation and flocculation is adding some chemical which change the surface properties of the coagulant colloids and make them agglomerate together. And in coagulation, the mechanism we can classify into four different categories. One is ionic layer compression, second one is adsorption and charge neutralization, third one is sip coagulation and fourth one is adsorption and in the particle bridging. And we have seen that how the particle concentration present in the water affect the coagulant dose. And we also found that it is very, very difficult to find out the optimum coagulant dose theoretically. So, if you want to find out the dose, we have to go for laboratory experiments using a jar test, which stim simulates the field conditions of coagulation, flocculation and settling. Then based upon that one, we can find out what is the optimum coagulant dose. So, today we are going to discuss what is the effect of alkalinity in coagulation and we will see what are the different types of water available and how the dose of coagulants vary and how can we go about for the design of rapid mixing, slow mixing and what are the factors to be remembered when we go for coagulation flocculation system design. So, alkalinity is very, very important when we go for coagulation and flocculation because we have seen that in water treatment as coagulants we usually add alum or ferric chloride. This salts as soon as we add to the water they will be forming aqua metallic ions. So, as a result what will happen? Hydrogen ions will be released to the system. So, the pH of the system will be coming down. But you know if we want to have a C flock aluminum hydroxide or ferric hydroxide should be formed. So, for this one the pH should be either neutral or above neutral that means pH should be above 7. So, if the pH is coming down by the addition of alum and if you want to maintain an optimum pH of 7 or above the water should be having sufficient natural alkalinity. If sufficient natural alkalinity is not there what we have to do is we have to add alkalinity externally in the form of calcium hydroxide and sodium carbonate. So, in most of the treatment plants along with alum we add lime. The purpose is to provide enough alkalinity so that the coagulation flocculation process is effective. We will see what is the chemistry behind this one. So, this is the reaction between alum and alkalinity. The alum whatever we, is, we are getting is hydrated alum, it will be re reacting with the natural alkalinity whatever is present in the water. So, it is in this form. This is the natural alkalinity. If natural alkalinity is already present in the water, it will be coming like this and the products are to aluminum hydroxide plus 3 calcium sulphate plus 6 CO2 plus 8, 18 H2O. From this reaction, it is very clear that for 1 mole of alum or aluminum sulphate, we need 3 moles of calcium bicarbonate or 3 moles of alkalinity in the form of bicarbonate. So, if natural alkalinity is not present, what will happen? The reaction will not be possible because this is the compound which, which is responsible for the sieve coagulation. Unless sufficient alkalinity is not there, the formation of aluminum hydroxide will not be proper. So, your coagulation will not be effective. So, what we have to do is if alkalinity is not there, we have to add alkalinity externally. 
So, this is what happens usually A L 2 S of O thrice 18 H 2 O. We are adding alkalinity externally, it is coming like this. This is nothing but lime. When lime reacts with water, we get calcium hydroxide and the products will be the same to aluminum hydroxide plus 3 calcium sulphate plus 18 H2O. So, this is what is happening if you add alkalinity externally. This is the external alkalinity and we will see this metal ions when we add to water because aluminum sulphate as soon as we add to water what will happen aluminum ions and sulphate ions will be forming. So, this aluminum ions will be reacting with water and it will try to give aluminum hydroxide along with this one many other aqua metallic ions will be forming. So, here itself we can see H plus ions are released. So, if you want to neutralize this H plus ions that is why we need alkalinity and one more point one more point is that if you take the residual residual aluminum concentration versus pH Okay, it is coming something like this, this is pH 7, 0. Okay, it is coming something like this. So, if the pH is above 7, okay, the optimum pH is around 7.2. At this point, aluminum hydroxide is having minimum solubility. What does it mean? If the pH is either this side or this side, the solubility of aluminum will be very, very high. So, you will be having very high aluminum concentration in the system. So, that is also not preferable. So, in that point of view also we have to maintain an optimum pH above 7. So, because aluminum this is aluminum hydroxide solubility diagram. So, we can see that it is having an amphoteric nature that means the solubility of this compound increases if the pH decreases or if the pH increases. So, that is why in coagulation and flocculation, alkalinity plays a very, very important role. So, th that is what I have explained here also. So, uh, metallic salts creates hydrated metal ions and this hydrated metal ions are acting as weak cationic acids. That means, each aluminum atom will be, e each aluminum atom will be combining with 6 water molecules because water molecules will be acting as ligands and this ligands will be dissociating and releasing hydrogen ions. So, whenever this aqua metallic ions are formed, hydrogen ions will be released and one mole of hydrogen ions needs half moles of alkalinity. So, depending upon the hydrogen ion release or depending upon the compound produced, we can find out what is the hydrogen ions released into the system. So, naturally whenever we add this type of salts, there is a reduction of pH. So, pH above is required for the formation of hydroxide flow. So, buffering of the system is required and usually we do the buffering by using calcium hydroxide or N sodium carbonate. So, if you want to see the optimum pH range of various coagulants we usually practice in water treatment plants. Here we can see alum the optimum pH is in the range of 5 to 7.5, but we always prefer a pH above 7. And for ferric chloride, it is a, it's starting from 4.5, 4.5 above it is able to work and ferric sul, ferrous sulphate or copperas, it will work only a pH above 9.5. And in water treatment, last class also I have discussed, in water treatment we prefer alum. The reason is ferric salt causes color and moreover depending upon the conditions, the or the oxi oxidation reduction potential of the system, ferric can be reduced to ferrous and so on, so on. So, aluminum will not be undergoing any further reaction. So, we always prefer aluminum for alum for the water treatment. 
and usually in water treatment if you consider the optimum coagulant dose varies from 5 to 50 milligram per liter and it, it depends upon again the turbidity and nature of water. Now we will see based upon the coagulation efficiency, the natural water can be divided into four different categories. It is basically depending upon the turbidity of the water and the alkalinity of the water because alkalinity is the parameter which decides the efficiency of the coagulation and we have discussed again how the turbidity or the concentration of colloidal particles affect the coagulation in the last lecture. So, in group 1 we consider high turbidity and low alkalinity waters. So, here what happens the mechanism of coagulation will be adsorption and charge neutralization because at low alkalinity what will happen when we add the coagulant to the water met aqua metallic ions will be formed and it will be having positive charge. So, positive charge ions are more preferred compared to non charged or negatively charged ions. So, this positively charged aqua metallic ions will be having high affinity towards the colloidal particles. So, they will be at attaching to the colloidal particles and neutralizing them. But if the pH is if the alkalinity is high what will happen the positive ions formed in the system will be low and adsorption and charge neutralization will not be effective. So, for adsorption and charge neutralization low pH is more effective. So, what will happen here high turbidity is there low alkalinity is there. So, adsorption and charge neutralization is taking place and because the turbidity is very very high once the particles are destabilized or the charge is neutralized there, there are high possibility of these particles to come together and agglomerate and settle down. So, in this case the coagulant dose required is less compared to other cases. Now, we will see what is the group 2 type of water here high turbidity and high alkalinity. Since the alkalinity is very very high the pH will not be affected by the addition of coagulant to the water system. So, what will happen the pH will be always in the higher side that means it is above neutral pH. So, at high pH seep coagulation seep flocculation is the mechanism of turbidity removal. Why it is happening like this is at high pH or high alkalinity aqua metallic ions formation or aqua metallic ions will not be having high positive charge. So, adsorption and charge neutralization will not be so effective. And now coming to group 3 water it is low turbidity and high alkalinity. So, here also since high alkalinity is there the aluminum hydroxide flock formation will be very very effective. And since small number of colloids are present no other mechanism is going to work because the chance of inter particle collision is very very low. So, the only mechanism which can work is seep coagulation. So, if you want to so seep coagulation we all know that the amount of coagulant required is very very high. So, if you want to reduce the coagulant dose what we can do is add some turbidity externally because if more turbidity is there the turbid particles itself will be acting as nucleus for precipitation and precipitation will be more effective and in effect we can reduce the coagulant dose. And now coming to the group 4 type of water low turbidity and low alkalinity. This is the worst type of water as far as coagulation and flocculation is considered. The reason is low alkalinity. So, this is not prefer preferable for aluminum hydroxide formation because the pH is towards the lower side and low turbidity since the turbidity is very very low adsorption and charge neutralization also will not be effective because low alkalinity will be forming positive aqua metallic ions and the particles will be getting destabilized, but enough number of particles are not there. So, they will not be able to agglomerate and settle down. So, the coagulant dose required will be very very high. So, if you want to reduce the coagulant dose either we can convert this water to type 1 water or type 2 water. Type 1 water means by adding alkalinity or by adding turbidity or together. So, if you add high turbidity what will happen it will be high turbidity and low alkalinity. So, the coagulation mechanism will be adsorption and charge neutralization. So, with 
less coagulant of we can remove the turbidity. If you add both, it will be converting to the type type 2 type of water. So, high, high turbidity and high alkalinity. So, sip coagulation will be working much, much better. So, now we will see, okay, we have find out what is the optimum coagulant dose and we can, we also seen how can we change the optimum coagulant dose by adjusting the turbidity and alkalinity or by changing the mechanism of coagulation. But after the addition of coagulant, we have to have a proper mixing of this chemical throughout the water volume. Then only all the particles will be having equal concentration of the chemical and once the particles are destabilized, there should be some mechanism by which we can make them come together. So, rapid mixing and slow mixing are very, very important in coagulation and flocculation. So, thorough mixing is definitely very important for uniform coagulation and for thorough mixing, the design parameter is velocity gradient and mixing time. Okay, velocity gradient is nothing but if you want to find out the velocity gradient between two particles, it is nothing but the relative velocity divided by what is the distance between them. For example, if two particles are there and if they have a relative velocity of 1 meter per second and they are placed 10 meters apart. So, the velocity gradient is nothing but 1 divided by 10 that means 0 0.1 and the time of velocity gradient is per t minus 1. And velocity gradient is usually expressed in the terms of power dissipated per unit volume or G we can express in this way, G is equal to power divided by volume into mu raised to half, where G is the velocity gradient expressed in terms of T inverse 1 and power input in terms of watts that is nothing but Newton meter per second. And volume, this is the volume of the mixing basin. That means, that much of power whatever we are supplying, it is getting dissipated in that com complete volume and the unit is meter cube and mu is the viscosity of water, the unit is Newton second per meter squared. So, usually for the design of rapid mixing unit, we provide a G value of 700 to 1000 and Usually the time varies from 1, one to 2 minutes, but they, they, there are inline mechanical blenders which works with very high G value. So, naturally the T, T will be very, very less that means 1 seconds and here the G value varies from 3000 to 50,000 per second. So, again once again the design parameter is nothing but G value and we have to be Okay. The G value for rapid mixing is 700 to 1000. In rapid mixing what is happening? The chemical is completely mixing in the entire volume of liquid and it is helping uniform coagulation. So, this is a picture of a coagulation flocculation unit. So, we can see that this is the influent pipe. Okay. And this is the rapid mixing unit. Okay. The chemical is coming here and here one mixer is there. So, and we can see that that size of this tank is very, very small compared to these tanks because the detention time required or the time usually we give for rapid mixing is only 1 to 2, two minutes. So, naturally the volume required for the tank is very, very less and this is the unit for slow mixing or flocculation and this is the clarifier or the sedimentation tank. After flocculation, big, big flocks will be formed and that will be entering in this settling basin and it will be settling down and this is sludge removing mechanism and all the sludge will be removing and it will be taken away from the tank. Okay, this is the cross-sectional area. So, we can see the influent pipe and baffles and this is the settling tank. So, this is another type of rapid mixing unit. So, we can see that this is the chemical feed and this is the influent pipe. Influent pipe is coming here and this is the baffle wall to dissipate the incoming kinetic energy. So, 
here see the opening is very very less so naturally the velocity will be high so here we are adding the chemical so there itself the chemical is getting mixed with the water and here another impeller is there which will be rotating at a very high speed so rapid mixing will be taking place and from here it is coming out to the flocculation unit and this is yet another configuration this is the inlet pipe and this is a baffle wall in both sides baffles are there and this is the mixture and it is rotating in this direction so what is happening we can see the water flow direction water is coming here from here it is flowing towards this direction and again it will come back here again another paddle is here so again it goes so complete and uniform mixing is taking place in this tank and the chemical feed is from here and it will it comes exactly the center of the inlet pipe and this we were discuss whatever we have seen now the three units those are mechanical unit that means we are supplying power by mechanical means or ele by through electricity or what and the unit is working but there are many non mechanical device which are used for rapid mixing and the advantage of this one is there is no maintenance cost and no energy requirement so it is more preferable but only thing is once we design this one and construct it if you want to change the system it will be very very difficult so most commonly used mechanical devices are suction side of a pump we know that the water will be sucked such a high pressure or so much of mixing will be taking place in the suction side of the pump so if you add your chemical there in the suction side of the pump what will happen uniform mixing will be taking place and another one is upstream from the hydraulic jam if you provide the chemical dose just the upstream side of the hydraulic jam so hydraulic jam what will happen the water is coming from water is in supercritical flow and it is changing to subcritical flow so whatever is the excess energy it is di dissipating in this hydraulic jam so if you provide or if you are the chemical just before the hydraulic jam so because of that jam there thorough mixing is taking place and the rapid mixing will be provided by this hydraulic jam this is not hydraulic pump this is hydraulic jam itself now we come to flocculation okay rapid mixing it is very simple you have to provide a very rapid mixing for a short period of time to make sure that the chemical is mixed thoroughly and the coagulation is taking place uniformly so by after this rapid mixing what will happen the colloids whatever is present in the water will be destabilized because the chemical action will be taking place there so once the particles are destabilized next job we have to do is make them come together and agglomerate so that the flocks will be formed and the flocks if we can get large sizes of flock the settling velocity will be much much higher and we can remove them effectively so in flocculation what we do is or the purpose of flocculation is nothing but create turbulence to promote collisions because if you pr provide a turbulence and many particles are there which are already already destabilized so what will happen because of the turbulence there are the chances of these particles to come together and agglomerate okay and this is achieved by providing velocity gradient and here also the design parameter is gt which is a dimensionless parameter here g is the velocity gradient and t is the time and we can see that the gt value varies from 10.4 to 10.5 this is the range we usually use in water treatment plants and t value varies from 10 to 30 minutes but usually we provide a time in between 20 to 30 minutes and depending upon the g value and the time we can make different types of flocks if we provide large g value with short t we will be getting small but dense flocks but if you provide low g value with long time larger and light larger but lighter flocks will be produced so from this one it is very very clear okay the g value and t decides the type of the flocks and we know if the density of the flock as well as the size of the flock are 
higher or more, then naturally the settling will be very, very high. So, it is always advised to go for a tapered G value or tapered GT value. So, initially if you provide a large G with short T, what will happen? You will be getting small but very dense flocks. Then the next portion of your tank, you provide a low G with a long T. Then what will happen? These small dense flocks will be forming larger flocks. So, the coagulation, the flocculation will be much, much effective. That is what I have written here. For removal, large dense flocks are preferred. So, it is always advisable to vary G value over the length of the basin. So, how can we vary? Initially, provide high G value with low T followed by low G value. And variation of G value from inlet to outlet, okay, if you want to get the best efficiency, it is advisable to provide G value in such a way that the G value is varying 100 percentage from the inlet to outlet. That means, the G, G value in the inlet, if you take the ratio of G value in the inlet to the to that of outlet, if the factor is 2, then your efficiency will be maximum. Now, we will see what is the mechanism of this flocculation. Okay? So, it is nothing but the transport of particles. Transport of particles, we have discussed earlier the coagulation flocculation is nothing but transport of particle and agglomeration of particle. Agglomeration of particle can take place only when they destabilize or they overcome the energy barrier, whatever we have seen in the last class. But once the energy barrier is overcome or the charge of the colloidal particles is destabilized, then we have to make them come together. So, that is the major role of flocculation. And this transport can be either by thermal motion that means Brownian diffusion or due to bulk fluid motion. So, in both the cases what is happening? A differential settling will be taking place. So, the chances of particle coming together is very, very high. Okay? The flocculation which is caused because of thermal motion or Brownian diffusion is known as perikinetic flocculation and the one which is caused by fluid motion or mechanical, mechanical means it is known as orthokinetic flocculation. So, if you want to find out the rate of change of total concentration of particles with time due to perikinetic flocculation because whether it is orthokinetic flocculation or perikinetic flocculation, our interest is to find out how the colloidal particle concentration is changing in the liquid. So, if you want to find out what is the rate of change of particles with respect to time by perikinetic flocculation, we can find out like this. It is represented by JPK that means rate of change of particles due to perikinetic flocculation and perikinetic flocculation is nothing but the one caused by Brownian movement that is equal to d n naught by dt. So, it is n naught is the number of particles present when t is equal to 0 and that can be it is equal to minus 4 mu k t by 3 mu into n naught square. So, we will see what this one. n naught is the total concentration of particle suspension at time t. This is epsilon that is the collision efficiency and k bar is Boltzmann's constant, T is the absolute temperature and mu is the fluid viscosity. So, it is a function of initial particle concentration and collision efficiency because we are assuming in most of the cases once two particles are coming in contact, okay, the particles are agglomerating and they are removing, getting removed from the system. But in most of the cases, it may not be true. Okay, the efficiency of collision may, may not be 100 percent. So, that also we have to taken into account and k bar because this is nothing but thermal diffusion. So, it is depending upon Brownian motion that is why this Boltzmann's constant is coming and fluid viscosity is very, very important. So, that number of particles present in the system at any time can be found out using this formula at not at, at t equal to 0 divided by 1 plus for if you integrate the earlier equation, then we will be getting this, this value, okay. 1 plus 4 mu k bar into 
n naught raised to 0 by 3 mu into t, t is the time. Okay. So, at any time we can find out what is the number of particles left in the system. Okay. Here n naught is equal to n naught power 0 when t is equal to 0 and we can find out from this formula what is the t half. That means, if you want this n naught equal to n naught power 0 by 2. That means, whatever was the initial concentration, if you want to make it half or the half life of this one, we can find out. This t half is nothing but 3 mu divided by 4 epsilon k bar t n naught 0 or at t half we can find out what is the n naught value. Okay? And t half is nothing but the time required to half the concentration. So, if you want to find out, okay, if you have virus in your system, so say initially 10,000 viruses per milliliters are were present and if you use this formula, we can find out the t half is around 200 days because you know that the diameter of the particle is very, very less. Okay, if you put this one here, we can find out that how much time we have to provide for the flocculation. Now, we will come to the orthokinetic flocculation because perikinetic flocculation we are not employing in water treatment plant okay, because that will be happening automatically and the particle size which can be effectively removed by perikinetic flocculation is very, very small. Okay. So, coming to orthokinetic flocculation, the contact of particles in orthokinetic flocculation is caused by fluid motion. So, that is why we are providing a mixture and providing a velocity gradient and because of this velocity gradient, the particles are coming in contact. So, we can find out the rate of change of particle concentration. So, this can be represented as G OK, okay. that means J OK okay because of the orthokinetic flocculation. The formula is nothing but minus 2 epsilon G bar, the velocity gradient D cube this is the diameter of the particle and at n naught naught this is the initial concentration of the particle by 3. Okay. And if you want to find out the ratio between J OK and J P K, okay, we just substitute both the equations and if you simplify we can get it like this mu into G bar D Q by 2 K bar T. Okay. So, orthokinetic flocculation is proportional to the velocity gradient and 3 power of diameter, whereas the perikinetic flocculation is depending upon the temperature and the Boltzmann constant. So, for d equal to 1 mu okay, and for a g bar or velocity gradient of 10 per second and temperature is 25 degree centigrade, okay, we can find out what is the ratio of j o k and j p k or in other ways, we, if you want to have s ratio J O K by J P K that means the removal by orthokinetic flocculation and perikinetic flocculation are equal that is what this one represent. Then in orthokinetic flocculation we have to provide a G value of 10,000 seconds. If, if the particle size is around 10 micrometer the G value we have to provide is only 0 0.01 second. So, from this one we can make out okay, if the particle diameter is very, very small orthokinetic flocculation and perikinetic flocculation are equally efficient and the G value we have to provide to get that equal efficiency is very, very high. But see if the particle diameter is slice 100 times that means it become 10 micrometer because this is the range of particles, colloidal particles usually we found find in water. So, if the particle diameter is around 10 micrometer the G value what we have to provide is only 0. Point not 1 per second or in other ways we can tell that orthokinetic flocculation is effective for particles greater than 1 micrometer. Okay. So, if you go for orthokinetic flocculation and the virus solution is there, okay, we will not be able to remove it effectively. Okay. So, orthokinetic flocculation is also known as macro flocculation. So, it is effective as the size of the particle increases the flocculation efficiency also will be increasing. Whereas, perikinetic flocculation, if you have very, very minute particles, perikinetic flocculation will be much effective. Now, we will see how to design a flocculator. Okay. 
in a clarifloculator. Clarifloculator is the unit commonly used nowadays in water treatment plants. So, in clarifloculator what is happening is rapid mixing, flocculation and settling in one time. So, we are providing all the units in a single unit. So, that is what a clarifloculator is. So, this is an example of a clarifloculator. So, here we can see this is the imbalal drive and chemical addition is taking place. So, this is the rapid mixing unit and from here it is coming here and here the flocculation is taking place because of the turbulence or the velocity gradient and this is acting as a settling basin and we get the clear water from here. This is the settling basin, so clear effluent is coming, this is the effluent and this is the sludge, okay, whatever is settled, okay, it, will, it is going out. So, here or in other ways, we can provide another type of a unit also, in the center, whatever is coming up, okay, the inlet pipe itself will be acting as a rapid mixture and here we provide a flocculator and this center chamber will be acting as clarifier or sedimentation time. So, how can we design a flocculator, okay, so or how can we find out the G value because we have seen that the design parameter of flocculator is G t, where, where G is the velocity gradient and t is the time and we also have seen that the G t value varies from 10 raise to 4 to 10 raise to 5 and we are providing the mixing by some mechanical means that means we have paddles and motor and it will be rotating at a particular speed. So, how can we design this unit because we have to provide the sufficient G value and according to that one we have to adjust the speed of the motor and sufficient area should be there for the paddles. So, now we will see the design parameters. So, the power can be calculated by using this formula D into V p where p is the power input in watts, d is the track force on paddles because we are rotating the paddles. So, when the paddle is rotating, the track force is acting on that one, so because of that one the velocity gradient is created and v p is the velocity of the paddles, and the unit is meter per second. So, track force on the paddle can be expressed using this formula C d A p rho v p q by 2. C d is the track force coefficient and A p is the cross sectional area of the paddles and rho is the density of water, V p cube is the velocity of paddle and C d is a dimensionless coefficient of track and usually we take it as a constant 1.8 for flat blades and A p is the area of paddles, paddle blades in meter squared, okay. usually we will not consider the thickness because the thickness will be very, very negligible. Okay. And we have already seen that the velocity gradient is nothing but p by v mu raised to half. So, g from this one we can calculate g is C d a a p rho v p cube by 2 v mu all raised to half. So, a p is the combined area of slots that are perpendicular to the cylinder of rotation. That means, if you have a flocculator, okay, the central shaft will be there and from that one the paddles will be there. So, we have to take the total area of all the slots that is moving in the water, okay. So, whenever we design a flocculator, these are the points to be remembered, A p that means the area of cross section of the paddles, it should be less than 40 percentage of the total paddle area. So, whatever the total area of the paddle we are providing, the cross sectional area A p should be less than 40 percentage and V p we are taking the velocity of the paddle tip, okay. So, velocity of the paddle tip usually we take it as 75 percentage of the paddle speed because the we are considering the velocity of water there in the paddle tip because that is more important for us because that is what creating the velocity gradient. So, what we usually find out is this V p whatever speed the paddle is rotating we are taking only 75 percentage of the paddle speed, okay. This is the relative velocity with respect to water and this V p should be always less than 1 meter per second that is the design parameters and whenever we provide a paddle, 
the mini, there should be a minimum clearance of 0.3 meter with the paddle tips and other structures with the horizontal walls, vertical wall, vertical walls, whatever be the thing, there should be a clearance of 0.3 meters. And once the flow clearance is over, okay, we are providing the G value and the water is remaining there for 20 to 30 minutes. And after the flow collection is occurred, the water will be moving to the settling tank. So, here we should be very, very careful. We should avoid turbulence from flocculating basin to the settling basin. If there are lot of turbulence is there, then what will happen? It will break the flocks already formed. So, what we, it ultimately results poor perf performance of the clary flocculator. So, care should be taken to prevent the breakage of flocks. And now we will see what all are the factors influencing the coagulation and flocculation. First one is coagulant dosage. Unless we destabilize the particle or unless we provide enough coagulant dose, the particles are not going to remove whatever the best way we design the rapid mixture and slow mixture of flocculating unit and your settler. Because unless the particle destabilization is not proper, they will not be able to agglomerate. So, coagulant dosage is very, very important. And next one is characteristics of water, because we have seen that the based upon coagulation and flocculation, the water is classified into four categories, type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4, okay, based upon the concentration of turbid particles and alkalinity. So, depending upon the turbidity, okay, the ease or difficulty in treating the water will vary. If high turbidity and high alkalinity is there, it is easy to remove by steep coagulation or if high turbidity and low alkalinity is there, then also it is easy because adsorption and charge neutralization is taking place, but the water is having low turbidity and low alkalinity, it is the most difficult water to treat. So, characteristics of the water is also very, very important. The next one is optimum pH zone. So, this we have discussed in detail because the precipitation of aluminum hydroxide is a function of pH. because we will be getting maximum precipitation or the least solubility at the optimum pH around 7 to 7.5. So, it is always advisable, advisable to maintain the optimum pH and coagulant rate. So, this coagulant rate, how, what is a coagulant rate? Along with the coagul coagulant, if we add some other substance which can enhance the coagulation, okay, that substance is known as coagul coagulant rate. So, what is happening here? Okay, if the turbidity is low, but we have added enough coagulant dose, so aluminum hydroxide is formed, but the precipitation should take place, isn't it? So, into to increase the precipitation efficiency, what we have to do? So, if you provide some nucleus, the precipitation will be very, very effective. So, if you add something similar to clay, fuller's earth, bentonites, or activated carbon, okay, this all will be acting as nuclei. Okay, so, this nuclei will be helping the precipitation. So, this if you add this coagulant aids along with the coagulants, then the efficiency of the coagulation will be increased. And another one is either if activated alumina, activated silica if you add that also significantly improve the efficiency of coagulation and flocculation. Activated silica is nothing but sodium silicate activated with aluminum sulphate or sulfuric acid or carbon dioxide or chlorine applied to water, it forms a stable solution with negative charge. So, this is a very good coagulant aid. So, if you add this one along with the coagulant, the coagulation will be very, very effective. So, this helps to produce a very dense flock. And choice of coagulant we have already seen. So, these are the different coagulants available, alum, ferrous sulphate or copperas, ferric chloride or chlorinated copperas and natural polymers. Natural polymers we have already discussed, we can use the seeds of certain plants. One is Moringa olifera or drumstick seeds. It is a very good natural polymer and it is also having disinfection properties, disinfection efficiency. So, if you use those things, okay, we will be getting good coagulation, flocculation or 
good removal of turbid particle. But only thing is this natural polymers when we use it, the leftovers will be causing some oxygen demand or since it is organic matter, the foul smell and all will come if you store the water for long time. And in water treatment, alum is preferred because there is no color, less solubility of precipitate and Al3 plus will not be getting reduced. But the disadvantage is aluminum hydroxide flocks are lighter than ferric chloride flocks, so the removal is difficult. So these are the recommended detection time and net power required given by the manual of water supply. So if the detection time is 60, velocity gradient is 300, net power input is 72 and this is the net power input per unit discharge and if the detention time is reducing then definitely the G value will be increasing. And these are different types of non-mechanical flocculators, this is non-mechanical flocculator. So raw, now we are not using, we have seen, discussed in rapid mixing, we can go for mechanical device or non-mechanical device, same thing is valid in case of flow collector also, the G value or GT value we can provide by mechanical means or non-mechanical means and here non-mechanical means the operation and maintenance cost will be very, very less and but the only disadvantage is it is very difficult to adjust according to the varied requirement. So sometimes the volume of water to be treated is very high or sometimes the volume of water to be treated is very less. In such cases, the adjustment of this non-mechanical flocculators is very, very difficult. So this is an example of a non-mechanical flocculator. This is horizontal flow, baffle flocculator. So raw water is entering here and because of this baffles, what is happening? The water cannot flow directly like this. So it has to take a deviation in its direction. So because of that one, velocity gradient is created and the particles are uh, agglomerating and the water is coming out here in the completely flocculated form. And this is another one, vertical flow, baffle flocculator and this is a jet flocculator, the water is coming here and rapid mixing is taking place here itself because chemical is coming along with the raw water and it, the jet here the mixing is taking place and it is coming out here and we can see baffles here and as it comes out, okay, there will be a velocity gradient because the diameter of the tank is increasing with respect to this horizontal distance. So the velocity will be varying and velocity gradient will be created and this is the baffle to avoid the short circuiting, otherwise what will happen, everything will be going, going up and coming out through this outlet. So this baffles help, help to provide more velocity gradient and avoid the short circuiting. And this is another type, Albana type flow collector. Here what is happening is, each chamber is having a separate inlet pipe. See, we can see here and the water is coming up like this and since it cannot go out through that one, it will be again coming back and, and this is the outlet or the trade, okay. So because of this one, the velocity gradient will be created. And this is another type, here also England plates are provided that will be providing the velocity gradient and this is at another type, the water is flowing like this and the sludge here, whatever is here, that will and it has to pass through this one, that is creating in a velocity gradient. And this is the modified type, here we are providing the pebbles and all, so that will be increasing the velocity gradient and these are the examples of mechanical flow collectors. So here what is happening, this is the paddle, we can see this is the flow direction, influent is coming and this is the motor which is rotating the baffle, the paddles, so flow is coming here, it is entering through here and the paddles are here, the paddles will be rotating in this direction in different chambers. So because of the paddle rotation, it will be giving a velocity gradient and because of that one, the flocculation will be taking place and this is the effluent pipe. 
okay, and this is the water level and this is and the type of mechanical flow collector. Earlier we have seen a mechanical flow collector where the paddle is rotating horizontally. Here the axis is in vertical direction and it will be rotating in this direction. So, influent is coming here and everything is getting mixed up thoroughly and flocculation will be take flocculation is taking place inside the system and the treated or the flocculated water will be coming through this drain. Okay. So, we have discussed about what is coagulation, what is flocculation and what are the mechanism of coagulation, flocculation etcetera. So, with using this data information if you want to design a problem, I will just give some important points how to do the design of a coagulation flocculation unit. What are all the important parameters we have to consider? So, see we have to treat 50,000 meter cube per day of water and optimum coagulant dose, dose is 40 milligrams per liter and GT value is 4 into 10 raise to 4 and temperature of the water is 15 degree centigrade. Okay. So, if you are asked to find out alum dose, tank dimension and paddle design, I am not going to solve the problem completely, I will just tell how to go around with this problem. So, how to find out the alum dose? Alum dose is this is per milligrams per liter and your water supply requirement is 50,000 meter cube per day. Okay. So, what we have to do? We have to find out what is the amount of alum required per month. So, you find out what is the total volume of water to be treated per month multiplied by this alum dose will give you the total alum requirement. So, it will be coming something like this 0 0.04 kg into 50,000 into 30 per month we have to find out. So, it will be equal to 60,000 kg per month. So, you can imagine what is the amount of alum we have to use for water treatment for a city. Now, we will find out what is the basin dimension and we know GT value is in the range of 10 raise to 4 to 10 raise to 5 and the design value is given as 4 into 10 raise to 4. So, we can assume a G value and you know the T value varies from 10 to 30 minutes. So, we can assume a G value and check the T value is coming within this limit. So, assume a G value of 30. So, you will be getting you will be getting a T value of 22.22 minutes. Once you know the T value, how can you do the tank volume? Volume is equal to Q into T. Okay. Then we can design the paddles using this formula. P is equal to D into VP. This is the way how to design a flocculator and a rapid mixer in coagulation flocculation. So, we will just see what all the things we have discussed so far. So, we have seen what is the importance of coagulation and flocculation, what are the different types of coagulants used for water treatment and what is the purpose of the rapid mixing and what is the purpose of slow mixing and we have seen in detail what are the mechanisms of coagulation that means ionic layer compression, adsorption and charge neutralization, then sieve coagulation adsorption and interparticle bridging, but as far as water treatment is considered ionic layer compression is not coming into picture at all okay? because this is happen because the amount of alum or amount of coagulant we are adding is not sufficient enough to create that much of ionic strength. Then we have seen what are the important points we have to be we have to be careful when we go for coagulation and flocculation system design okay? because this is applicable only for particles greater than 1 micrometer diameter and flocculators and 
uh, rapid mixtures can be either mechanical units or non mechanical units non mechanical units are having very less operational and maintenance cost but the flexibility is very very less but coming to mechanical unit operational and maintenance cost is there but we have more flexibility and whenever we go for design it is always ad uh, advisable to go for a tapered velocity gradient provision the reason is okay if you provide large g with small time you will be getting small dense flocks and low g with large time we will be getting large but uh, means light flocks so it is always ad advisable to go for tapered g value <laughs> Thank you.